on the last full day of campaigning in the 2024 race as the candidates make their final pitch to voters in the most critical battlegrounds. Former President Trump making four stops across three states today as Vice President Harris goes all in on Pennsylvania with four stops across the Commonwealth. Speaking this morning in North Carolina, Mr. Trump surprising the crowd with a new message on immigration and Mexico. If they don't stop this onslaught of criminals and drugs coming into our country, I'm going to immediately impose a 25 percent tariff on everything they send in to the United States of America. You're the first ones they've told it to. Congratulations, North Carolina. Because if that doesn't work, I'll make it 50. And if that doesn't work, I'll make it 75 for the tough guys, and I'll make it 100. Now, it comes as the former president has also closed in these final days with ramped up rhetoric and violent imagery with new attacks against his opponents and also the press. The image of our country is terrible. It's terrible. It's a failed country. That's a very demonic party. It's become it's become that way. And I have this piece of glass here. But all we have really over here is the fake news. Right? And to get me, somebody would have to shoot through the fake news. And I don't mind that so much. Cause I don't mind. I don't mind that. And if you don't vote, you're stupid. You're stupid. They're terrible people. There's something wrong with them, actually. There are a lot of things wrong with them. If she wins, you will live the rest of your life as second-class citizens in your own country. Meanwhile, Vice President Harris is closing with a more traditional and cautious approach with appeals for unity while ratcheting down the attacks on her rival, purposely not mentioning Mr. Trump by name during an event in Michigan last night, even though she's repeatedly called him out by name as unstable and unhinged over the last week. Today in Pennsylvania, the vice president leaning on that unity message, talking to canvassers in Scranton. This whole era of this other guy, you know, it, but it, what it's done with all that talk that's been about trying to have us point fingers at each other and divide each other, it makes people feel alone. It makes them feel like there's nobody standing with them. As we are getting out the vote, as we are canvassing, let's be intentional about building community, about building community, about building coalitions, about reminding people we all have so much more in common than what separates us. Now, the shift is coming on the heels of a shocking poll out of Iowa, showing Harris up three points over Trump in a state that former President Trump won by eight points in 2020. Helping drive that number, a massive gender gap with Harris up 20 points among women. It comes as our final NBC News poll shows a neck and neck race nationally and a massive gender gap there as well of more than 30 points. Let's get right to the very latest from both campaigns and from the trail with our NBC News team. Garrett Haig is in Pittsburgh ahead of the former president's event there later this evening. Gabe Gutierrez is in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where the vice president campaigned earlier today. Maura Barrett is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, tracking reaction to that very surprising poll I just mentioned. And Antonia Hilton is in Battleground, North Carolina, where Mr. Trump campaigned earlier today. He added new stops in this final stretch. Garrett, let's start with you. It's the very last day of the campaign. We heard Mr. Trump debuting that new message on immigration, essentially promising new tariffs on Mexican goods unless illegal immigration stops. What does that tell you about the view within the campaign and his strategy in these closing hours? Well, look, I think it tells you a couple of things, uh, Kristen. First of all, there is no policy problem to Donald Trump that cannot be solved with a skillful application of tariffs. He's believed this uh, throughout his political career. He's doubled down on it time and time again. In this campaign, he did so again today. Second, I think it shows us what we know has always been the case, the ad hoc nature of policy development in Trump world. It's entirely possible that that policy announcement was news to his campaign staff. I've not seen anything else from the campaign about it today. I've not seen a press release or a Truth Social post. 
Uh, and think finally, it shows that Donald Trump is still looking for a way to kind of solidify what has been a polling lead on the economy among voters, but to kind of really get the hooks in people, particularly his core supporters who will vote on Election Day, give them one last reason to turn out if they've not been paying attention uh, to his policies thus far to do so. Garrett, take us inside the campaign. What's the temperature? What's the mood? Obviously, they are publicly projecting confidence, but what's your indication privately? Yeah, publicly projecting confidence and using publicly available data to do so, Kristen. The campaign has yet to open up its internals and show us what their data shows, which I think is the kind of thing that suggests the picture they may be looking at internally isn't as rosy as what they are projecting externally. Now, the former president has been adding events these last couple of days. You noted that he's in North Carolina today. That's a state that his campaign or members of his campaign were telling me as recently as a week or two ago, they thought they had in the bag. His behavior and the campaign's rhetoric are not necessarily in alignment here on that confidence. I think what we have heard from Trump in the last few days in his interview with Dasha Burns over the weekend and with uh, John Carl of ABC News, a little bit more openness to suggesting the possibility entering his mind that he might lose, which is not the kind of thing that he ever entertains on the campaign trail, certainly not in front of an audience where even today he continues to say that the only way he'll lose is by cheating, kind of planting the seeds to dispute yet another election's results. Yeah, and Garrett, what's notable, of course, that reporting you have comes against the backdrop of this gender gap that we saw in our poll and certainly in that Iowa poll. How concerned is the campaign? Is Donald Trump about that? Well, look, uh, Donald Trump has kind of personally rejected the idea that he has problems with women, although there's been reporting that he's been asking friends and allies about ways that he might turn it around. The simple reality here, Kristen, is that this ship has already sailed a long time ago. I mean, Donald Trump never made any significant move towards the center or real significant move to reach out to women, except for the uh, program that he sort of floated in an interview with NBC News about paying for IVF treatments for all Americans, and then almost entirely dropped from his stump speech after that. Uh, I think the Trump gender gap view here is that they have to simply maximize the end of the okay. gap that works for them. That's turnout with men, jacking it up for them, depressing it with Harris's supporters. That's what they've been talking about the campaign's last days. That's what I expect we'll hear from the former president tonight in Pittsburgh. All right. Garrett Hake, Homestretch, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Great stuff. Gabe, let me turn to you. Trump is hitting three states today. The vice president really largely focused on one. Does this all come down to Pennsylvania for her? Yeah, Kristen, she is really all in at this point in Pennsylvania, although her campaign says that they are focused on all the battleground states and each of them are extremely close. Now, right behind me, we are getting uh, set to welcome Kamala Harris to this uh, gymnasium. She's set to speak any moment now. But as you said, she is crisscrossing Pennsylvania today. She already stopped earlier today in Scranton. And you alluded to this in your introduction. She is kind of shifting her message a bit, a more positive message, according to campaign officials. Didn't mention Donald Trump by name just referred to him as this other guy again that she did that also last night in michigan as well now we're expecting her here in allentown then she heads uh, to reading where she'll visit a puerto rican restaurant and then larger rallies this evening and tonight in uh, pittsburgh and in philadelphia certainly kristen as you know the most valuable resource of any candidate is their time and it's easy to see in these closing hours just how critical this campaign feels that pennsylvania is kristen you're absolutely right about that. And just to follow up on the point you just made, the fact that she's clearly courting Latino voters, Puerto Rican voters in the wake of mm. that Trump supporter who called Puerto Rico garbage, there is a sense that has backfired on the ground in places like Pennsylvania. What are folks on the ground there in the Commonwealth telling you? You know, Kristen, that's such a good point. And look, I've been speaking to Puerto Rican voters for quite a long time, ever since you know, Hurricane Maria and before that, there has been large frustration among that community that the U.S. mainland does not pay enough attention to them, that the federal government doesn't pay enough attention to them. Well, I'll tell you, the Puerto Rican voters that I spoke in line this morning trying to get into this rally, their sense of frustration was palpable. They were angry. They were outraged at those racist, offensive comments by that comedian at that uh, Madison Square Garden rally. And they say that it 
will make a difference here in Pennsylvania. Allentown is a majority Latino city, some 34,000 Puerto Ricans in this town alone. And some of the voters I spoke with said that, look, some of their friends were even considering voting for former President Trump were leaning in that direction. But when they heard of those comments, they've now switched to Kamala Harris. Now, that's just anecdotal. We'll see how that plays out tomorrow, of course, when 70 percent of the vote in Pennsylvania comes on Election Day. But that's why the campaign is so focused is today trying to get out there in, in multiple stops uh, throughout the state and trying to win over that critical Puerto Rican vote that could potentially make the difference in this election, Kristen. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, well done talking over the noise of the event that is getting underway. I know that is not easy. It is a skill. We appreciate you very much and your reporting. Let's head over to Maura Barrett on the ground in Iowa. Maura, thanks so much for joining us on this election eve where there was a bit of a political earthquake over the weekend when a very reliable poll came out in Iowa showing Kamala Harris with a lead of three points, 47 to 44 percent. This is not a state, quite frankly, where she was competing because it is reliably red. I've been talking to folks inside her campaign who say, look, we're not expecting to win Iowa per se, but we are encouraged by the fact that she does have a 20 point lead among women voters in that poll. What are you hearing and what do you think the significance is? Well, Kristen, I don't think any of us expected to be looking at Iowa at this point in the election cycle. This isn't part of the timeline where we usually look at, at Iowa. And it threw the political world for a loop, understandably, because relationally, back in September, the same poll found that Trump was ahead by four points. And so we all in the national media were confused by uh, this poll coming out. And frankly, here on the ground talking to voters, they were surprised by it, too. I want you to hear some of the conversations I've had with early voters in line here today and then yesterday in Lynn County as well. Do you see a, a world in which Iowa could, could vote for Harris? Maybe. It's, uh, the, 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 this is a, what has been historically a swing state between Republican and Democrat, so I'm not going to be shocked if Harris wins the state. Do you think that could happen here, given Trump's strength in the state? Uh, I hope so. Yeah, it would be... Um kind of unheard of for a Republican state to go that way. But yeah, I'm excited. I see the polls are leaning that way for Iowa. Now, the first voter you heard from voted for former President Trump, the second for Kamala Harris. And something that stood out to me in this poll is the fact that senior women and politically independent women were what appears to be driving that shift towards Harris. Now, it's important to know that here in Iowa, a very strict six-week abortion ban took effect this summer. And so it's likely that that might be something that's driving women to shift uh, their mindset. Everyone I talked to uh, both yesterday and today that mentioned that they were voting for Harris brought up the idea uh, of their concern around reproductive rights as well as the threat to democracy. Uh, and so it is an interesting point of conversation at this point in the campaign, given that the campaigns haven't invested here. They haven't visited here. Uh, and so the pollster herself, uh, Ann Seltzer, with the Des Moines Register for the Iowa poll, pointed out any shift that we're seeing on the ground in Iowa is all happening organically, Kristen. Incredibly fascinating data point with just hours until Election Day. More Barrett, thank you so much. Antonia Hilton, you are in North Carolina where Trump has now campaigned three days in a row. Uh, NBC reporting shows the Trump campaign might be just a little nervous about the Tar Heel state. It's a really fascinating state. Obviously, Thank the you. Republican gubernatorial candidate is incredibly controversial there. Democrats haven't won the state since 2008. What are your sources telling you, Antonia, about the state of play? Well, Kristen, to put it bluntly, they're feeling very bullish now, and it's a combination of factors. So first, in the beginning of the early voting period, Republicans were coming out strong. But in the last few days, they started to see the numbers from the black community here in North Carolina and these young Gen Z voters, sort of in the college areas, the college towns, starting to come out in big numbers. Then the Iowa poll, that might not sound like it has anything to do with North Carolina, but there are parts of the electorate here that's very similar. And so if she's overperforming with white voters here who are similar to white voters in Iowa, that's huge here. And some people have suspected for weeks she might be doing well with white voters here in the state. Then they have the gender gap, and then Mark Robinson, the lieutenant governor, running for governor here. 
enveloped in complete scandal. Many of them see him as dragging down the entire ticket. Take a listen to a conversation that I just had with Governor Roy Cooper here. Do you think it is really looking like 2008? I do. There's a lot of positivity on the ground. There's a lot of energy right now for Kamala Harris. I was in Charlotte this weekend. Uh, when she has come, she has lit people up. And of course, 2008, that is a reference to the last time a Democrat was able to flip this state. But we just keep hearing from people that they think this moment is the best chance they have seen uh, since then. And what you're seeing happen behind me here, people starting to come into the field office here in Raleigh. They're doing phone banking. They're heading out. They're planning to knock doors. They're not going to get let any of these last few hours today go to waste because they want to see some of these final numbers, this big push tomorrow. They think they can get this over the edge, Kristen. Well, we will have to wait and see. Antonia Hilton, great reporting, great interview. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.